Let's talk about getting a force of the soldiers of the greater good on the tabletop, with an overview of starting a Tau Empire army in Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Tau, and in this video I thought we'd do an overview of starting a new army from a standing start, talking through some of the best reasons to collect an army in the first place, some things to think about and plan when you're getting going, a few ideas for first miniatures to pick up, and finish up with some ideas for expanding the army, a look at some rules, and one example army list. Loads to talk about for the Warriors of the Firecast, so let's jump straight in. Starting out, why might you want to collect Tau Empire in the first place? The Tau really do have a very different feel to many other armies out there in Warhammer 40k. A race of high-tech and futuristic Xenos, fighting in great technological Marvel battle suits, maybe taking some inspiration from Japanese styling and manga. In the face of a galaxy of horrors tearing itself apart, the forces of the Tau are a newer, optimistic, and maybe more naive Xenos species in the realm of 40k. Their dynamism and relentless devotion to their greater good causing them to push out in spheres of expansion, constantly running into yet more horrors from the 41st millennium as they do so. The Tau function as a caste-driven society, with great earth-caste engineers and fire-caste warriors, all guided by the shadowy hand of the ethereals, where there's certainly some hints that the utopia they promise isn't quite all it's cracked up to be. Unusually compared with many armies in Warhammer 40k, they're often negotiation and attempts to bring planets and races into the fold through diplomacy, though if that fails, the railguns of the fire cast will break down any barriers. Tau typically favour ranged warfare fighting in their mobile Honda cadres with their dual tactical philosophies of Montcar and Kaoyon. Miniatures wise, the Tau have a pretty cool aesthetic, sleek curved armour plates and slightly more graceful war machines than that of the Imperium, with plenty of glowing plasma, lenses and jetpacks. Their miniature line I'd say is actually kind of medium aged for Warhammer 40k, though given their kind of futuristic aesthetic I think it holds up really well. They do tend to have quite nice kits with lots of different options for different weapon customization and drones to accompany their miniatures into battle. They also have a nice recently refreshed range of crude alien mercenaries, as you know species on a bounds to fight for the Tau, and the two are often seen fighting in concert. For some examples of their miniatures, here on the left we have their standard line infantry, the Fire Warrior Strike Team, carrying the Fearsome Pulse Rifle, XV-8 Crisis Battle Suits, are perhaps the single most iconic unit of the Tau, veteran Fire Warriors that have proven themselves time and time again to be worthy of piloting one, often descending from the skies with Manta Strike to take down the heart of the enemy army in daring insertion operations. There's plenty of battlesuit variants, some bigger and some smaller, the Ghost Killer is a stealth battlesuit, Often the first thing that the enemy knows of its presence will be some mighty shooting out of its Fusion Collider or Ion Raker. The Tau do have some armoured units as well, such as this Hammerhead Gunship. The deadly railgun has been known to pass all the way through and out the other side of certain Imperial tanks and armour. And leading the Empire are often battlesuit commanders. Commander Shadow Sun leads the forces of the core Tau Empire with her stealth battlesuit and dual fusion blasters. There's also the imposing and shadowy Commander Farsight, gone renegade from the rest of the Empire, rebelling from the Ethereal's rules, and one of the few Tau to fight in close combat with that possibly cursed Dawnblade. Their most recently releasing miniatures are their new and refreshed range of Crute, a very very different aesthetic to the rest of the Tau. Carnivorous Birdmen Alien Auxiliaries here. Crew carnivores are their battle line force, and they have some bigger and heavier beasts to ride into battle, they're kind of like a mini faction within the Tau at the moment, often fielded as a supporting role for the main force, though they can be fielded as their own army if you like. Price wise I must admit it's not enormously good news for the Tau Empire, 10th edition points changes made Tau units pretty cheap, and that does mean that you do need quite a lot of them to make an army of any one size, they are currently one of the more expensive armies to collect in Warhammer 40k, when in the past they've often been a bit more middling. I'd argue that on average they aren't one of the absolute most expensive armies in the game, though certainly on the upper end. Finally for gameplay, the Tau Way of War is fairly different to many of the rest. Their current rules are from Codex Tau Empire, classically fighting with highly mobile ranged firepower and very little melee and no psychic abilities, so maybe aren't an army that tends to use all phases of the game quite as much as some. Their core cool army rule is for the greater good, and this has tower forces work in pairs to coordinate boosted damage, often one unit with marker lights guiding you to better damage against one foe. 
spotting targets for your biggest guns. In the Tau Codex, there's three Tau detachments and one crew themed one, the detachments being an aggressive Montcar, a more reserved and shadowy Kaoyon, and the retaliation cadre for the battle suit, dropping and giving some big support to all manner of their most iconic units. Classically, the Tau Empire do tend to be a bit gun line, given that they're all ranged units. I would argue that in 9th and 10th editions, though, Tau have generally needed to push up to take and hold the midfield objectives, and it means they can't just sit back, destroy the enemy army, and then move forward later on quite as much. You need to balance being aggressive with taking down the foe. Currently in the game, they're really quite strong with quite a lot of usable units. We'll have to see the eventual points cost for some of their codex units. Though for the most part, Games Workshop has done quite well with their units, making most of them fairly viable. Overall, if you want an army of technologically advanced Xenos in battle suits, blasting the enemy sky high with all manner of fancy weapons, the Tau Empire might be the choice for you. If you do decide to go with the Tau Empire army, there's plenty of ways that you can learn a little bit more about the faction before jumping in. Picking up Codex Tau Empire might not be the worst start. At time of recording, it's sort of an early access release, and you might get a few people reselling it on eBay out of the Crude Hunting Pack box set, though it won't be too long until it goes on full sale. That's handy enough for a bit of backstory of the faction, the unit profiles and detachment rules, and generally say it isn't the worst place to start for an army. You could potentially have a play around with army lists with things like Battle Scribe, New Recruits, and Warhopedia. Maybe think about proxying armies and having a bit of a try before you buy with having other miniatures stand in for your army, or try that on Tabletop Simulator, if that's your kind of thing. Here on YouTube, there's an awful lot of Tau content as well. I have made a few Tau Empire Codex videos myself, a full overview of the Codex here on the channel, a tier list, and a few unit reviews for them. Hopefully I'll keep a fair bit of Tau content coming. There's a massive amount of stuff on other channels, of course, though. Battle reports, painting guides, and lore. And there are a fair few small YouTube channels dedicated to Tau themselves. Plenty of good content out there if you just give it a search. I'll also say that if you're getting into a faction, it's worth following along with them on social media. Check out the Tau Empire Discord server, Facebook groups, or subreddits. Really quite nice places to follow on with general discussion about any one faction in 40k. And maybe ask a few basic questions yourself to current collectors if there are some newbie questions that you'd like answering. Otherwise, beyond that, you can think about what sort of Tau Empire army you'd actually like to wind up with as you build towards it. As mentioned, I think it's not the worst idea to plan out a rough 1,000 point or 2,000 point army list as a rough way that you're going to start with. It doesn't matter if it might change later on. I'd say that Tower one of the better developed and more fleshed out factions of Warhammer 40k, certainly one of the major ones, and as such, with a good model range and plenty of theming, there are genuinely different ways that you could take the army. Some people quite like to just collect balance, just build up a more generic set force of your own theming and focus on units that you like the feel of and rules in game. Or you could let something a bit more specific, maybe going for a battle suit heavy army. Some people like to try and make a full suit army work. Or you could do things like focus on the tower infantry and armor, maybe a fish of fury type build with devilfish backed up by hammerheads and sky rays. You could collect an army with a heavy alien auxiliary presence, maybe a force that has a hefty allied contingent of those alien crew mercenaries. And you can also have them as the dominant element of your force now, although I think they do profit from being backed up by big Tau guns. If you are going down a more standard Tau force though, there might be a decision to make as to whether or not you're running a more far side enclaves themes list, or a force that's core to the Tau Empire. You have to choose between either using Ethereals in the army or Commander Farsight, as the two really don't get along in the lore, to put it mildly. Finally, you could also think about collecting to one of the given detachments in Codex Tau Empire, Certain things will be a bit better in the Montcar Force, Kaoyon, Retaliation Cadre, and perhaps more obviously the Crude Hunting Pack. Those rules should stick around for at least a fair time now, though the Tau Army rules might get reinterpreted when they say get a new codex in the next edition of the game. As well as all this, the Tau Empire do have some septs in the lore. Tau septs are sort of like their home worlds that act as fairly independent strengths and military might. The Tau from the homeworld are the Tau Sept on the bottom right here, who often fight in their Okra armour. The ones that you'd see on the box art are actually the Viola Sept. They have the white armour with the red accent colour, and they're well known for being unusually fierce and hot-headed, liking to destroy the enemy at close range. There's Dalith in the green armour that like to get along with the alien auxiliaries perhaps more than most. The city fighters of Sakir and the scientists of Borkan. And of course the mighty red armour of the Farsight Enclaves, fighting from their fortified worlds on the Damocles Gulf. 
Otherwise, for detachments, you can take any combination of units in each one of these, and they do have their own patient theming, and you can use any sept in any of these. The only actual rules choice that you make is Farsight versus Ethereals from a sept point of view. Carry on it is the strategy of the patient hunter, generally getting big damage boosts late in the game. Montcar is an aggressive first strike with giving you big damage and movement buffs early on. Retaliation cadre is your force themed around battle suits, particularly crisis suits dropping in close. And the crew hunting pack gives you some massive boosts to the crew units, making them unusually durable and dangerous with some sneaky tricks. And it doesn't actually stop you taking some Tau units along to support. Perhaps four detachments is a bit fewer than I would have expected for Tau as a very major faction in 40k. But to be honest, I would say that all of these are well realised, and they all have at least some pretty strong stuff that could tempt you to play them in a competitive setting. You could absolutely collect a balance army and mix it up between these game on game, trying different rules out to give you a bit of different playstyle experience. Also in the planning phase, it's worth talking about paint. If I were you, I would start by painting up a test model for the army. Likely a single fire warrior might be a good start. Something that's small and low investment enough that you can see your colour scheme realised on a model, and if you decide that you don't like it, then you can redo or tweak the design, and it's not going to take forever, say compared with starting with a really big battle suit. Generally, tower considered at least fairly easy to paint up, nice big flat sections of armour that are just quite easy to realise with just regular paint, maybe a bit of dry brushing or highlighting, and some ridges to shade in fairly straightforwardly. Overlying some more metallic elements or cloth elements on the infantry, it works quite well with dry brushing or contrast shading. There's plenty of good painting guides out there if you want to execute any one given colour scheme. Loads of content on YouTube that can give you a bit of inspiration with painting tower one way. You can absolutely just copy one of the accepted designs and one of the more classic colour schemes, maybe give it your own twist if you want to. The general tower thinking is they often adapt their colour scheme of their forces to match in with their environment but then have an accent sept colour, say for example this fire warrior with the red sept colour here for Viola. In reality though, many of them have their dedicated dress uniforms as well, and it does mean that there's just a lot of scope for painting tower basically how you like. Getting into perhaps the most exciting bit though, and let's talk miniatures. Currently if I was starting tower empire from a completely standing start, I think there really are quite a few credible choices right now. I feel like the combat patrol box sets for the faction are good enough, the current one with the ghost kill or the new upcoming one with the devilfish and commander. Otherwise, if you wanted a smaller investment, maybe just picking up a box of fire warriors to try out some paint schemes and things. And still more options could be a set of the XV8 crisis battle suits or maybe the crude hunting bat box set. Though obviously that does mean that you want a heavy presence of alien auxiliaries, which I wouldn't say that literally every tower player does. Some combination of these sets though will be a pretty reasonable entry point to the faction. Starting with the combat patrols, this is the one that's available at time of recording, though won't be around for much longer. This is combat patrol tower for 9th edition. It contains two on foot characters, an ethereal and a cadre fireblade, ten fire warriors that you can build as either strikes and breaches, plus you get their little drones and turret, three stealth battle suits with their marker drone, and a shadowy ghost kill suit. The price on Games Workshop's combat patrol box sets are £95, €125 Euros, or $160, and as ever with Games Workshop's combat patrols, they do represent a discount compared with buying the miniatures individually, around about 38% off, which I say is on the upper end of combat patrol box sets now. Currently you get 400 points worth of Tau in game, which maybe isn't excessive for combat patrols. I would say that says more about the way that Tau are at the moment, having their units cost really quite cheap in game. Overall, I would rate this as a pretty reasonable entry point to a faction though. It's certainly a tower of a given theme, given that you both have stealth suits and a bigger stealth suit here, so all very shadowy and using their high-tech cloaking technology. I would say that pretty much all of these units are really quite playable for the tower right now. The stealth suits look like they're going to be standout good in the upcoming codex. The ghost kill is really frustrating for opponents, being a big gun unit that you just can't shoot back. The fire warriors are pretty great with the Kadra Fireblade. I guess maybe the only criticisms for this are that you can't put both the infantry characters in the fire warrior team. So it might mean that you need to pick up some more. Overall quite a nice box set, I like the miniatures. The stealth suits are the oldest miniatures in the box, so I still think they hold up basically fine. As a counterpoint to that, here's the new Tau Empire upcoming box that should be coming to replace it alongside the full codex release. Likely in around about a month at time of recording, a Games Workshop can be a bit variable with their release dates. This one gets you a Tau Battlesuit Commander, a Devilfish, a unit of Fire Warriors and a unit of Pathfinders. Again, all useful units in my opinion. Not quite as many in-game points at 355, 
and a slightly lower discount compared with the previous one, only 30% off versus 38 In all honesty, if you can land the 9th edition one and this one, it seems like they do have a bit of synergy together. You could have breaches with the Cadra Fireblade and transport them up the board in the Devilfish, which is a pretty tried and tested competitive combo, and then still have a strike team for the Ethereal to lead to guard a home field objective. Overall, I'd also rate this as a pretty reasonable box. You would need to pick up a squad of Crisis Suits for that commander to lead at some stage. But if you're collecting Tower, that's quite likely to be a purchase that you make at some point down the line anyway. While buying 40k miniatures, I'd certainly be aware of the different options that you have. Direct from Games Workshop is generally the most reliable, but also the most expensive. The system that they have is they have discount retailers that can give 10-20% to off Warhammer products. And in general, if you're seeking new plastic kits, that's usually the way that I'd go. There's quite a lot of options for these out there around the world. Though I do have plenty of links down in the video description, Element Games in the UK for 15% off, Gap Games in Australia for 21% off, Fenris Workshop in Canada for 10% off plus their store loyalty program, and Wargame Portal in the USA for 15% off. If you were going to buy through Games Workshop, these will save you a significant amount compared with the plastic that you'd get there. If you use any of those links down in the video description, it does help out the channel a little and keeps these videos coming. They don't cost any more to use than elsewhere though. Otherwise though, if looking to economise further, bear in mind the second hand market, Tower been around for a while, their kits definitely crop up on eBay from time to time, and while quality can be kind of variable, it can be a pathway to save a bit of time, effort and money getting an army together. In this day and age, 3D printing and third party manufacturers definitely exist for creating near proxies to Games Workshop models, I've seen Piper makes as quite a fun one for the town. There's plenty of great alternative sculpts and different takes on battle suits out there, and it can be an interesting option for getting certain aesthetic upgrades or weapons. Beyond combat patrols though, let's talk about a few of the other Tau Empire kits. The 10th edition big launch box for the Tau is the Kroot Hunting Pack box set. This one gives you a big force of the new range of alien auxiliaries, two characters in a flesh shaper and a war shaper, a Krutox rider, three Krutox rampagers, and 20 carnivores plus the new codex and datasheet cards. Pricing for this one came out at £135, $220 or €175, Euros, and that would look like it represents a significant discount on the models inside, around about 40% including the codex. It was definitely a start crude box set as opposed to a start tower box set, and admittedly the crude alien auxiliaries aren't what everyone's most interested in when they're starting tower. Could be an interesting enough way to have a force of alien allies ready to go straight away though, it looks like this one sold out from Games Workshop in some places, though not all. At time of recording, out of the affiliate discounters I've got in the video description, Femris Workshop in Canada and Element Games in the UK still seem to have supply of them, though some places have sold out. This one won't be around forever. Otherwise, focusing on some of the other core Tau Empire kits, I'd say at least one squad of Crisis Battle Suits is worth getting at least fairly early. They're the most iconic unit in the army, pretty much. They were changed in the new codex to be a bit less flexible, and you basically filled them in some forge, fire knife, or star scythe formations, whether you want to take out tanks, elites, or light infantry. Actual power in game will depend on final points, which could certainly change, though I feel like these some forge ones look particularly interesting right now. Pretty enormous anti tank rerolls, and get good support from plenty of the detachments out there. I feel like for tower battle suits and hard points and things in general, if you can be bothered to magnetise them, I would recommend it. As magnetising things in 40k goes, the tower about as easy as it gets, and it really is quite satisfying just to be able to reload your battle suits with different weaponry to depend on the foe that you're facing, or if you want to try out a new tactic, the end result can be quite satisfying. For drones at the moment, I'd probably recommend at least one shield drone per suit, and then gun drones beyond that. You could maybe have one marker in the units if you also want to give them the option to guide other squads. Otherwise, focusing on the Fire Warrior troops, these guys can be built as either Fire Warrior Strike Teams or Fire Warrior Breacher Teams. Currently, it seems that the favoured competitive loadout are Breacher Teams in Devilfish, maybe with a Cadre Fireblade to keep that pulse fire to the maximum intensity. They do seem like quite a nice tower option for skirmishing over the midboard, destroying enemy troops trying to take those objectives, and then putting a big high objective control squad on the point after that. I feel like a strike team with an ethereal really isn't the worst home objective holder though. They're a little bit tougher with the feel no pain, generate you some command points, and can make one enemy unit minus one to hit each turn. 
If I were fielding the strike team, I'd arm them with pulse rifles, not pulse carbines. And I'd take the Guardian drone for them as well. That gives them a minus one to wound and seems basically auto include for them. Their box sets are £35 or $60, less than that with the discounters in the video description. And bear in mind that these come in the combat patrols and that might be the most efficient way to get your hands on them. Beyond some of the most iconic tower units, I'd probably also want to get some heavy firepower to sit on the board and destroy enemy tanks and armour at long range. Broadside battlesuits have some massive great big rail guns and are generally quite scary. The Skyray missile defence gunship is a little bit better against fly targets, though just very scary damage output in general. The hammerhead gunship's also pretty good for that. And the Riptide's interesting in that it's maybe more durable than it is dangerous, so it could be a good heavy hitter to have on the front line compared with some, particularly as it gets to fall back and shoot. I'd probably complement some of the above units with some out of this selection. Then it's useful to have some more expendable screening units for the front lines. Troop carnivores do seem like a particularly interesting thing to have in the force right now, given that they help out with objectives with that sticky objectives type rule, plus are just a cheap infantry unit that can scout into the midfield. Stealth suits I think are also going to be a pretty important unit for Tau armies to have to help guide and mark things for them, as well as the standard buff that they get a plus one to hit. The stealth suits now allow you to re-roll hit rolls of one and wound rolls of one, which is a pretty massive damage boost on top of the normal guiding thing. Combine that with the fact that they're a relatively cheap unit of infiltrators, and they look like they're looking really quite a good unit in the upcoming codex. Finally, at time of recording, Tau Empire have a whole load of troop miniatures that are currently shortly to be released. The character miniatures and the squads individually, plus a few things that didn't come in the hunting pack box set, like the Lone Spear, Croot, Hounds, and that Trail Shaper. I feel like most of these don't feel like they're maybe super necessary to add into a Tau army. I feel like the single best supporting unit on paper feels like just the standard Croot mercenary carnivores. The Rampages maybe seem interesting enough to have the option of an actual genuinely scary countercharge unit in the lines though. And I feel like the crew maybe aren't in the worst place ever, maybe a little bit extra and not super necessary to a core tower force, but genuinely look like they could be made into a pretty problematic army for some enemies to deal with if you play them in the hunting pack formation. Just to sum up thoughts for collecting and expanding a tower army, in general I'd like to get a force of a few of the more iconic units of the faction together so you can actually get some games and get some core cool models on the table and then expand to various different elements of the army that can do certain roles really well. In Warhammer 40k there's always a lot of scope for just collecting what you like the look of. 40k rules do change over time with balance updates though in general for each army certain units just do tend to be at least fairly relevant for the army time after time. Currently at time of recording, Tau units are generally at least fairly strong and most data sheets in the codex are really quite usable. More so than certain factions in the game I'd argue. I'd likely start out by one or more of the value sets, maybe add in some crisis suits from their box set and then maybe expand to some of these elements like devilfish with breaches and a cadre fireblade, perhaps a ghost kill, some heavy fire support, something in between broadsides, riptides, sky rays and hammerheads. Something to do some nice guiding with, likely stealth suits from the core codex. You could go for world tetras, though I'd be aware that they're maybe a bit expensive and made of resin. And maybe some fun crisis and commander combos that you could use some fun enhancements on and have some scary suits dropping in close. I'd probably try and have some idea of a rough 2000 point army list that you're building towards and work towards it chunk by chunk, buying expansions to the army in small jumps, getting it painted and getting some games in perhaps more so than going out and buying a full army list all in one go. When you've got your Tau Empire force ready to hit the table, perhaps one of the most important rules for the army is for the greater good. This is their ability for basically two units to work in pairs. One unit counts as an observer unit, and one unit counts as a guided unit. If they can both see one enemy unit, then the guided unit gets a nice boost, plus one ballistic skill, so often hitting on threes rather than fours. And if the Observer unit also had a Marker Light, then they get to ignore cover as well, which is quite important in 10th edition given how common cover is. Some units like the Stealth Suits make this rule even better, and it basically is kind of necessary to coordinate this to make your tower efficient. Hitting on force means their firepower doesn't generally get to be all that good without it. Though it does make the shooting phase maybe a little bit more of a thinking process, you can actually make some of your firepower worse with this, as you get minus one ballistic skill for a guided unit that doesn't shoot at its nominated target. 
which can be a little bit problematic for certain units that have maybe got a main gun and some backup weapons that they'd usually want to fire elsewhere. Otherwise, for supporting rules, there's four different detachments. The Retaliation Cadre is the battle suit one. The core rule favours those suits being brave and getting in close, getting big damage boosts to their weapons. They've got some nice supporting things like the battle suit stratagem to drop in right next to the enemy, which is just ludicrously scary with a tooled-up crisis and commander combo. They've also got a one command point stratagem to move, shoot, move with their battle suits, an iconic tower move that means that you can pop out of terrain, blast some of the enemy units, and then move back somewhere safe. The Monkai Detachment is aggressive tower. Their units get the assault keyword if they're guided, and they get lethal hits on all their shooting for the first three turns. That's really quite a scary combo to get lines of sight and then deliver mass damage when you get it. Quite nice for things like Riptides that want to be moving up the board a bit quicker and have some mid-strength weapons with the Ion Accelerators. There's a nice stratagem for auto-advancing 6 inches which can get you some ludicrous movement to get a line of sight on something unlikely. And if you do lose an important unit in your army then for one command point you get two re-roll hits against that unit for the rest of the game. Quite a nice thing to lay it low in retaliation. Carry on is the Patient Hunter Detachment, this one you have to delay gratification and get your damage boosts from round 3 onwards, but when they do come they're just absolutely enormous, sustained hits 2 on all your firepower that's guided is a massive damage boost, every time you get a 6 it turns into 3 hits on the target, pretty scary if you lock out with a railgun with that. They do also have some fun supporting stratagems, I quite like their enhancement exemplar of Carry on to get that Carry on rule from early on. A battlesuit commander dropping in with that round 2 is a bit of a staple in this detachment. Finally, the crew hunting pack no doubt makes you want to go heavy on the crew units. You get a 5 plus invulnerable save against ranged attacks, and then you get to get damage boosts against the enemy once you chip some initial damage off them. A plus 1 to hit, and maybe a plus 1 to wound if they're below half strength. Their most powerful stratagems are a 2 CP one to take a unit of crew that just died and then put them back into reserve so you could have 20 more carnivores coming on from the side of the board and one called Hidden Hunters that can just basically say no to enemy shooting. One unit that's greater than 12 inches away can't be shot this phase, really big if you need to hold an objective with it or maybe had a scary damage dealer unit like a tooled up unit of Crewtox Rampagers. In general I feel like this army would want to go heavy on the crews but not completely eschew scary tower firepower, take a few things with some dedicated strong anti-tank to cover the crew weaknesses, maybe things like hammerheads, sky rays, broadsides or some forge crisis suits. Finally to put that all together here's just one example of a rough balanced army list for the tower, not really aiming to be anything massively optimal or anything like that, but taking a good balance of objective scoring units paired with some heavy hitters and using some strong elements from both combat patrols, the 9th one plus the 10th one. The list is headed up by Commander Shadow Sun herself, a nice load operatives with some big anti-tank and some re-rolls for nearby units, and also an enforcer commander with a psychic iron blaster, three plasma rifles and shield drones, taking exemplar of Cao Yon for some big sustained hits on the drop. He's going to be with a squad of Sunforge suits, just an all-out anti-heavy threat that should be able to drop in and reliably take down one of the biggest tanks or vehicles in the enemy army. There's then two units of 10 breachers in Devilfish with guns and guardian drones. They can move up to take the midfield and skirmish with enemy infantry. 10 pathfinders to potentially guide and shoot the enemy with some rail rifles. 10 crew carnivores to do some screening things or maybe mark the home objective with the sticky objectives rule. Two mighty riptides with iron accelerators and plasma rifles for some heavy threats on the front line to deal with some enemy infantry. Two units of three stealth suits to guide and screen. A spooky ghost kill in the backfield that can't be shot at long range, hovering out some shots with the ion raker. To take down some heavy tanks and vehicles, there's two sky rays with smart missiles on top of their fearsome long range missile launchers, and two broadsides with heavy rail rifles backed up by seeker missiles and plasma rifles for if the enemy gets in close. Finally there's one annoying scouting piranha with a fusion blaster, could be a good thing to do some secondary objectives early, or just get in the way or do nuisance charges to enemies turn 1. The points for this one are around about 2000 points though not exact, this one's more just to showcase the general idea of what you could have at that kind of army level, certainly exact unit choice could vary a fair bit. In any case, I hope that's provided at least a few ideas for getting a force of Tau Empire on the board in Warhammer 40k. Look forward to hearing your thoughts, insights, or any other tips and tricks from experienced players down in the comments below. 
In any case, if you enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I'll leave a link to a few of my other tower videos, including the Codex review and the tier list video, down in the video description if you'd like to watch something else for the Empire. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you have found this video useful and you'd like to support the creation of more. Channel patrons do get a few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.